items on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be uh, accessed via live via online streaming either on the assembly website or democracy live. Okay, item one then is apologies. Have we any apologies? None. Good. Um, item two then is the minutes of the 10th of the September meeting, which are pages 5 to 12. Um, members, if you have an opportunity to read those on our members' content that I sign those minutes. Great. Great. Read. Thank you. Item three, then, members, is the declaration of interest. Members at each meeting are required to register relevant financial and other interests in the members' um, interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr. Muir. Yeah, I'll just declare, as probably I do <coughs> nearly every meeting, I was previously an employee of Translink, and uh, my stepfather is the quality manager of the A5 project. I don't get the has. Okay. Any others? Uh, chair of Nice Gone Jericho, which is a charity. Okay. Um, uh, agenda item four then is matters arising. Uh, pages 14 to 24. <coughs> Excuse me, members. Last week we had a briefing from Stuart Stevenson, the Treasurer Officer of the Accounts uh, for the 2018 19 theft and fraud report. During this report, the Audit Office made uh, members aware of their role in reporting on fraud. The Audit Office has since forwarded their recent report on COVID-19 fraud, which is your packet, pages 14 to 24. Members, are you content to receive a briefing from the Northern Ireland Audit Office on COVID-19 fraud uh, report and combined with the TOA uh, when the TOA returns to the committee in the new year to present the next theft and fraud report? Before members answer that, um, I'm speaking to the Controller and Auditor General after the meeting last week. Members were clearly very interested in exercise about fraud and about the issues, for example, about um, illegal dumping, um, gyro drops and issues like that. Uh, and I think it would be useful, I mean, if any fraud is, is, is rotten and wrong, particularly during COVID, I think it's particularly rotten and wrong. Uh, but uh, in terms of general issues around fraud, I think it would be useful to to get a, a briefing jointly with Mr Stevenson and with the Audit Officer. Members content with that? Um, what I'm saying is broader than COVID-19. Is that okay? Great. Members mm -hmm. agreed? Okay, <coughs> good. Um, that's fine. So that's agreed. Members, and I, I am declaring interest as the Chair of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. The CPA Virtual Conference on 19th and 23rd of October 2020 Westminster Workshop on Public Financial Oversight as I've said before, nominations have been sent to the CPA. Um, this is that is myself, Mr. Beggs, and the clerk will be attending. Um, for further information, has been requested on the agenda and how the conference will be managed. Do you content? Take it. No other member wishes to attend. No. Okay. Right. Okay, members. I refer to the papers t table um, at page three of your pack. Uh, which is a memo from the Audit Committee dated the 14th of September 2020, notifying the Committee that the report on the estimates of Northern Ireland Audit Office have been led and is published. Um, members, at this stage, we will be continuing to remain in public session. Are members content with that? Great. Uh, agenda item 5, then, is correspondence, which is pages 26 to 34. Members, there are a number of pieces of correspondence in your main pack and table pack on the impact of a recent High Court ruling, May 2019, then upheld in February 2020, that all decisions should be made by commissioners and not staff of the Commission. Uh, this has significant implications for the Charities Commission, which has been re reported uh, by the Controller and Auditor General in the Charity Commission report and accounts for 2019-20, and I refer to pages 5 to 94 of your table pack. One serious implication is that the uh, invalidation of some 6,000 bodies who had received charitable status. The Department of Communities is assessing the full impact of this decision and the Controller and Auditor General is uh, keeping it under review uh, as well. 
Members will recall that the CNAG informed this committee of his intention to conduct a review of the Charity Commission earlier this year in response to concerns raised by the former Charity member, former, former members of the Disabled Police Officers Association. This letter is tabled in your packs for ease of reference at pages 94. Sorry, 95. I will now draw your attention to the specific pieces of correspondence before you today which relate to this matter. Members, you will see correspondence dated 29th of August 2020, pages 26 to 31 of your pack, from Mr. Joe Hughes and members of the Life Saving Charity Volunteers to Mrs. Patricia Lappin, um, Chief Commissioner of the Charity Commission for Northern Ireland, CCNI, in which the PAC and the Committee for Communities have been copied into. Could the committee please note that this paper is restricted? It refers to the alleged unfair treatment of the life saving charity volunteers and the ramifications of a serious, uh, series of decisions that the author believes to be to the detriment of the volunteers. Uh, the author states that there has been an abuse of public funds which warrants an open inquiry. Members, on the basis that the Department of the Communities uh, Committee is um, assessing the full ramifications of the, the recent court decision regarding the Charity Commission and has requested a briefing from the DFC Minister, are you content to write to the Chair of the Committee for Communities, um, Ms Paula Bradley, MLA, asking the Committee to keep us informed of any developments in relation to this? Great. 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 <coughs> Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 11th of September 2020 from Mr Trevor McKee regarding a letter sent to Mr Kieran Donnelly CNAG regarding the CCNI annual account 2019-20 at pages 32-34 of your pack. Could the committee please note that this paper is restricted? Members, are you content that we write to seek the views of the CNAG on these issues raised in this correspondence? Great. Great, thank you. Members, please see correspondence from Mr Robert Crawford, dated the 15th of September on the CNAG's report on accounts for the Charity Commission, pages 116 of your table pack. Are you can, content to, that we seek Mr Crawford's permission to forward his correspondence to the CNAG for comment? Great. 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 Thank you. Members, please see correspondence from Mr Robert Orton, pages 97 to 115 in the table pack regarding the CCNI annual accounts 2019-20. The information received, including Letter to Mr. Orton from Nicole Lappin, the Charity Commissioner, dated the 10th of July 2020. Letter from Mr. Orton to Nicole Lappin, Chief Commissioner, dated the 15th of August 2020. And a letter to Mr. Orton from the Information Commissioner's Office, dated the 10th of September 2020. Are you content, members, that we seek Mr. Orton's permission to forward this correspondence to the CNAG? Great. Comment? Great. Great. <clears throat> Members, are you content that once we have the information on these, that we respond uh, to the correspondence and or acknowledge their receipt of correspondence in the interim? Is that agreed? Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Members, for your agreement on those issues. Um, item 6 is in relation to ministerial direction in relation to infected blood payment scheme, pages 36 to 41. And at this stage, I would like to invite Mr. Kieran Donnelly, Controller and Auditor General of the Northern Ireland Audit Office, and Mr. Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer, to the table. Um, members, please see a letter dated the 11th of September 2020 from Mr. Kieran Donnelly, Controller and Auditor General, at pages 36 37 of your pack, providing details of the ministerial direction in respect of the Infected Blood Payment Scheme. Also, at pages 38 to 40 of your pack is the correspondence from the Department of Health Permanent Secretary Richard Pengelly, uh, dated the 4th of September 2020, and from the Health, uh, sorry, the Minister for Health, uh, Mr. Swan, dated the 17th of August 2020, outlining the new direction to uplift payments in line with England, resulting in an additional uh, annual commitment of 1.1 million to, uh, in payments. At this stage, I would like to invite Mr. Donnelly to brief the committee. On this ministerial direction, Mr. Donnelly. Good afternoon. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think this is a fairly straightforward direction. Um, the, the minister uh, had asked the department to, to uplift the the rates in line, get parity with uh, the rest of the UK. 
uh, and I suppose the reason for the direction is uh, the department hadn't completed the, the business case on that at that at that juncture, uh, and that's all there is really to it. I don't think I'd have anything more to add at this this point. Okay, Mr. Bingham, you anything to add? No. Okay. No. Members, any questions? Okay. Um, content to note. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, members. Um, agenda item seven then is an inquiry into the land web project and digital transformation um, <coughs> briefing session, pages 42 to 156. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Karen Donnelly, Controller and Auditor General, Mr. Rodney Allen, Director, uh, Pamela McCready, Chief Operating Officer. I don't think Pamela's here today, no. Um, Christine Bird, uh, Audit Manager. Mr. Allen, good afternoon. It's been a while since you've been here. Ms. Burns, good afternoon. You're very welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. And I also um, would like to have uh, Claire Dorn, the Audit Manager, who's joining us remotely. Claire, can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine, yeah. That's good. Okay, good afternoon. Okay, yeah. Very good. You're, you're very welcome. Okay, and thanks to the clerk for keeping me right there. <laughs> okay, over to you folks. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity to, to brief you. We have really two reports, and there are common threads between them. There is the report uh, we published uh, it was about 15 months ago on digital transformation. That is the big report. Uh, the secondary one was a, a follow-up on uh, the land web project. Uh, for land registry. Uh, that's a much smaller report, but there's some themes that straddle both reports. Um, before I hand over to, to the team, uh, I think just want to make a couple of very general points. What are the big issues in these in these couple of reports? And I think the biggest issue to me is uh, really the department's capability to manage large, complex, long-term contracts uh, with major uh, players in the market, such as BT, uh, and then to look at how those arrangements could be strengthened. So uh, the big, big issue is about around contract management. Uh, the second issue is, is one about value for money, uh, and it's really, um, you know, what has the taxpayer got in return for the the 110 odd million that has been committed to digital transformation, uh, and uh, in our report, we, we, we are not able to give a positive assurance that the, the taxpayer got value for money on that case. Nor are we able to give positive assurance on the land web project either. So there's uh, the value for money assessment, and uh, Rodney can take you through the detail of that. Uh, the, the third sort of issue is uh, then to explore where, where we are in the Northern Ireland Public Service and the whole journey of digital transformation. Digital has enormous potential actually to, to improve the quality and efficiency of public services. And I think we have seen that during the COVID crisis, uh, mm -hmm. that those organisations that are further advanced in, in the digital world have found it easier to, you know, to get through the crisis. So, uh, is to explore how far we are along that journey and the potential, really, of digital, really, to transform public services. Those are the three three main themes, Chair. And uh, I think, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rodney then to take you through the the, the detail. Okay, Rodney. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, if you're content, I, I, I'll not go through the written brief in any detail. Okay. Members I think have we're that, content. but I, I, I'll take I'll some speaking notes. If you if you permit me, about five minutes on Lambweb and maybe eight or nine on NI Direct. Um, and just to set the scene, Christine was the manager on Landweb um, and is very familiar with the detail. And Claire joining us on the screen um, led on the the heavy duty value for money report on the NI Direct contract. So if I kick off, members, with um, Landweb. So we published that report back on the just on the 16th of June past. Now the report it was a relatively small piece of work, and the report itself is relatively short, but it attracted fairly significant media interest at the time. Um, it was produced following anonymous concerns from a member of the public that were raised with us through an MLA um, about this particular project. 
So that prompted us to look back to the previous recommendations made by PAC back in 2010. So just a wee bit of background. LandWeb is used to process all registrations and charges on the three land registers. That's the main land register, register of deeds, and the statutory charges register. And it allows users to go in and search for information in, in the registers and indeed to make payments. So way back in 2019, following an open and competitive procurement process, um, LPS within the department um, entered into a concession agreement with BT for a £46 million PFI project called LandWeb to improve the efficiency and customer service. It was BT's responsibility to develop, install, test, operate and maintain the IT infrastructure and the service. It was for BT to finance the design, build, data conversion and operation of the service, recovering their costs entirely by receiving a, a set transaction fee, which in turn um, was part of the charge then that the department levied on its customers. So it's just important to emphasise that LandWeb is a fee-driven service. So the report that we produced back in 2008 that examined the background of the LandWeb project, um, it, it looked at the reasons for extending the original agreement, the project management, the governance arrangements, and indeed whether the system was delivering the expected benefits. This committee um, took, that, took that report in March 2010. Um, PAC was concerned, believed at that time that better value for money could be secured, and made eight recommendations. So we have, we, we have also referenced this work and PAC's earlier work in our NI direct contract, which, which we'll come on to. So in terms of summarising the findings, really it falls into three categories, which Kieran was, was giving us the gist of, um, poor strategic planning. So this led to a series of extensions to the concession agreement. The original agreement was for 17 years through to 2016, was extended to 2019, and then again to 2021 and a further extension beyond 2021 will be necessary um, because the procurement of our placement system is still at an early stage. So we're, we're looking at an excess of, of 22 years plus. The contract value um, through to July 2021 is estimated to be just short of £107 million, so that's 138% more than what the original estimated value was. So in our opinion, um, sufficient time should have been made to allow uh, to explore, um, negotiate and put in place alternative arrangements to enable the agreement to be terminated. Secondly, value for money mechanisms. Uh, Kieran advised you that we couldn't conclude on the uh, positively um, with assurance on the value for money, so there were no mechanisms in the agreement. What does that mean? Well, that might take the form of benchmarking, market testing, open book accounting, tools that could be used. Um, which would actually have helped the department in its negotiations with, with BT. The department didn't consider those were appropriate for various reasons, some of which we've outlined in paragraphs 13 and 14, where we've provided some of the reasoning around that. And thirdly, members, is this aspect of overcharging, um, overcharging of fees. So the users of land web services have been overcharged since the, the, the fees order of 2014. It's out of date, and the fees have been set too high. So the net surplus generated over the past 13 years is approximately £39 million, which has been absorbed into the public purse, um, effectively a form of, of indirect tax, um, local tax, as, as the customers are, are paying too much for the service provided. So all of that detail is, is set out, members, in your pack. We did recognise in, in our report that um, a fully functional and consistent IT service has been provided by BT throughout the, the project. Um, however, our conclusion was that the lack of these mechanisms to secure better value for money um, for, system, for, for citizens, if they had been in, that would really heavily have influenced the Department and LPS's agreement with BT and ensured greater transparency and competitiveness. We also recognised that the Department did negotiate some concessions from, from BT, um, both um, when it was looking at extending the contract in 2011 and also £1.8 million covering the term 2019 to 2021, which was represented a 30% reduction in BT's charges. But that said, we still couldn't find the evidence to demonstrate that this project has delivered value for money. We actually found that particularly concerning in light of the recommendations made by PAC back in, in 2010. Um, at the committee in March 2010, the accounting officer at that time said that, um, and I quote, if we were doing it now, we would do it differently. 
we would certainly take account of the guidance that is around and incorporate these types of conditions into the contractual position. So we, we therefore believe that that should have been pursued more rigorously at the breakpoint. Um, and they, they, had they been retrofitted into the contract, that really would have helped the department in its negotiations with BT on extensions. Members, we made three recommendations in this particular report. Uh, we stated that for future agreements, strong contract management controls should be in place to ensure any procurement process is completed before an agreement expires. Agreements should be very clear um, and the mechanisms that should be used for, for value for money and be included as contractual conditions. And lastly, a new fee order should be introduced urgently. So just finally on this one, a, a few final points, members. Really in relation to developments since we published our, our report, um, um, at a meeting of the Finance Committee the subsequent day after the publication, the, the, that committee asked the Department um, when it would expect to see the proposals on a new fee order, as recommended in our report. So the Department of Finance wrote to the committee on the 26th of June, um, and that committee shared that with, with your committee staff, and I understand was in your pack um, last week. The Department's correspondence notes that the impact of the current coronavirus pandemic um, it is affecting the property market, and the Department is considering possible scenarios for the tra trajectory of the property market and analysing, obviously, the impact that would have on fee income. The Department informed the Finance Committee it intended to bring forward proposals in the early autumn, with a view to having a new fees order made by the end of this calendar year to give the legal profession a required three months' notice for the new fees to take effect from 1 April 2021. So in conclusion, in this first report, um, we naturally are very pleased that PAC has chosen the report alongside the one on NI Direct. Um, we think the evidence session next week will provide an opportunity to question the Department on areas that might include um, poor strategic planning, something we will discuss further now in the NI Direct report, what the lessons learned have been by the Department, what the actions taken to improve are and will be, and establishing the exact position currently on um, a new fees order. Okay. Um, are any of your colleagues looking to make any other contributions around that? What we thought, Chairman, if you're content, was that, that I would keep going and yes, take, yeah, take the means. next report, yeah, and then good. members can maybe see some of the, the read across between, yeah, between okay. the subjects. <clears throat> I'll just draw a breath and grab it. So the NI Direct um, report, we published this report in the NI um, Direct Strategic Partner Project on the 14th of June 2019, so that this one's just over, just over a year old. Uh, background is that the Northern Ireland Civil Service, it manages many large transformation projects, of course it does, and many of them have been before your committee. This report considers its performance specifically in relation to what is a key digital project. Um, all public bodies are increasingly relying on digital transformation. Um, to deliver better public services, and evidence no less um, through the current COVID-19 pandemic. So back in, in October 2012, the uh, Department of Finance agreed a £50 million contract with BT to provide IT solutions, skills and capabilities to support the migration of NI public services online. Our written brief contains more information on the nature of the contract, but essentially BT was to support NI public uh, bodies move citizen services online by providing IT solutions, skills and capabilities. And all the other departments were directed that when developing or refreshing programmes involving online or telephone interaction, that there should be a presumption in favour um, of using this strategic partner project. The Department of Finance was then responsible for the overall management of the contract, and that would include monitoring and challenging the costs whereas the responsibility for managing and delivering the individual projects um, rested with the individual departments. So at the time of our report, the contract had funded a contact centre. It had developed 13 major applications, two consultancy contracts, and a number of cross-cutting applications um, across various central government departments. We found that the department has revised the estimated spend three times the contract expenditure is now expected to total £110 million by October 2022. That's £60 million and more than double the um, anticipated costs. 
quite a number of findings, members, if, if, if I can just take a quick canter through them. So our main findings, um, whilst we observed, yes, there, there's progress has been made um, on Northern Ireland's journey to digital transformation of public services, but we concluded that the efforts have lacked ambition and the pace of change has been much too slow. The health, local government, welfare, policing sectors were not prioritised for funding um, through this particular project, despite the fact that we believe those are the services most valued by, by the public. The public citizens want a tell me once approach um, for services and indeed the verification of them, but the work on the My, portal, My Direct portal to facilitate that was not prioritised at the outset. The rationale for procuring several early projects also was not, was not clear. Um, early projects included providing consultancy advice and replacing out-of-date systems um, rather than developing innovative digital um, solutions, so they weren't transformational. We also found there was little evidence of um, public bodies working together or indeed with their counterparts in GB or elsewhere to identify innovative, transformational, citizen-centred solutions. The Department's financial controls were not strong enough to ensure that this strategic partner project was managed effectively. Um, prior to September 2018, when we were out doing our, our audit fieldwork, the Department did not have a record of the overall costs incurred through the contract. And this was something that we had already raised concerns about in the financial audit work that we do on Kieran's behalf when we audited the Department's financial statements in 2016-17. We noted that in January 2016, there was a gateway review of this particular project and it questioned whether the contract had outlived its usefulness. It was critical of BT's failure to provide transparency of their annual accounts, despite a contractual undertaking for open book accounting. And the review concluded that innovation from BT was patchy, with the, the bulk of the, the innovation coming from subcontractors or indeed from within the civil service itself. Internal audit of the department in 2016 provided what's called a, a limited um, audit opinion on the project management because of the overcommitted expenditure, the lack of actual spend details and an absence of um, BT information. Then there was a review by external consultants of the project in 2017. Now it concluded that um, in their opinion the project had delivered value for money but they highlighted a number of concerns. <coughs> Relating to contract management, the consultants commented that there had been a failure to fully apportion roles and responsibilities, which resulted in additional effort to manage the contract and ensure compliance. Um, the absence of a dedicated and skilled contract management resource was considered a deficiency in the Department's approach. Um, obviously, in our findings, we noted the, the, the expenditure level which I, I referred to there at £110 million by 2022, more than twice the original value. During our, our field work on this particular study, um, we looked at, at the contract itself and we, we identified that, unfortunately, the department misunderstood the terms of its contract and in error it assumed that it was a, a contract for a duration of 10 years um, with a break point at seven years. Instead, we identified that the contract was a seven-year contract with an option to extend for three years. So DOF could not terminate after seven years because it wasn't prepared. It had no alternative arrangements in place to provide continuity of the services. And also, members, we find um, the actual savings generated as a result of, of all of this um, move and work to online provision, they're not, they're not available. Um, so there was no monitoring or validation of actual reductions in costs, so for instance, um, reductions in staff costs. Instead, the department uses a, a figure of £99 million saved, which is generated um, using a, an indicative savings estimate for each um, transaction that's processed online. So in, in essence, I, I would summarise that all into three critical points. Most significantly, the absence of good contract and project management poor prioritisation of projects, and finally, insufficient measurement of the, the savings associated with them. Um, our office, Kieran, has done work on this before. Um, we referenced Lamweb back um, in 2008-2010. We also had a, a report back in 2007 on electronic service delivery, and um, our report indicates at that time we also found limited compliance with the guidance, no baseline audits of services, um, 
lack of prioritisation and indeed lack of consultation with customers um, on what they actually needed. In, in this report, and I'm, I'm not too much more to go, members, in, in this report, um, we welcomed by the Department uh, a deep dive review of its Audit and Risk Assurance Committee undertook um, when we were doing our field work back in October 2018. That um, deep dive review really explored in some detail the, um, the financial and contractual positions with the project, and it brought to light some of the concerns um, that we've now put into the report, and it, it really helped the non-executive members of the department um, get a clearer understanding of some of the difficulties that existed within this uh, contract, and which we hope our, light, uh, our report has, has shone a light on. So, in view of all of this, um, we could not conclude that to date digital transformation has delivered value for money for our citizens. There has been some progress, but there is a long way to go um, before NI public services are really transformed and, and citizen-centred. In terms of recommendations, we made 10, uh, including the need to make real progress with this tell-me-once approach, which is really what public citizens want in terms of accessing and using services. Those are listed in your brief, um, along with the departmental responses to the recommendations. I think <coughs> it is worth noting um, a number of those recommendations straddled not just the department, went beyond the Department of Finance and straddled all the other departments. So in providing departmental responses, the Department of Finance um, indicated that for those relevant recommendations that other departments have been consulted and also agree with the recommendations that were made by the Audit Office. And when we published, um, the CNAG in its media release uh, said that strong financial controls must be in place. Sufficient expert resources should be retained throughout the duration of major contracts, and achieving the full benefits of digital transformation must involve better collaboration and the development of truly transformational services that work across public sector organisations. I think that sums up the gist of, of the report in this instance. Finally, members, in relation to developments since we published that report just over a year ago, um, we are aware that there has been considerable change in key staff responsible for taking forward this area of work and the oversight of the contract. Uh, we've also been cited on a draft by the NI Digital Transformation Service of a Digital Skills and Capability Research Report, which has been prepared in response to some of the recommendations that were contained within our report. And we also learned recently that since the publication of our report, the Department has put BT in breach of contract. So we expect um, Chairman, that those points and other points, no doubt, would be matters that the Department would wish to expand on when they give you um, evidence next week. In conclusion, there, there are many aspects in this report. Um, hopefully, this verbal brief has given you a sense of that that we believe can be used to inform EAC in exploring your contract management and its implications, which in turn should hopefully help with a suite of recommendations to assist better management of future similar contracts. Um, that's it, Chairman. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Uh, any other member of the team wish to add anything to what Mr. Allen has said? <coughs> okay. Okay. Well, look. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think at this stage, um, in thanking you for the the um, evidence you've given, uh, with members in agreement, we would go into closed session and take questions uh, uh, to the team uh, in closed session. Members agreed. Great. Great. Thank you. <coughs> this is the.